Odds Friday, the smell of mailbags is in the air. Our favorite day of the week when you ask the questions and I answer as many as I'm inclined to do so in about 20 minutes. Taking your questions on pit football, basketball, and recruiting. Questions all come from the message boards at pantheler.com and we put them right here in the mailbag edition of the Morning Pit every Friday right here at youtube.com slash pantheler.com unless Jeff Capel hangs out with us on Thursday, then Jeff Capel gets the Friday slot and we don't do a mailbag, but that didn't happen this week. I didn't hang out with Jeff Capel yesterday. And so you get a mailbag today, and we appreciate everybody who submitted questions. A lot of good questions on the message boards at pantheware.com. Had a little bit left over from last week, and then we'll uh, dive into this week. Good questions covering all the usual topics, football, basketball, and recruiting, because that's what we talk about at pantheware.com. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com for all the pit sports coverage. You guys submitted the questions. I'm looking forward to answering them. So why delay? Let's jump into it. It's the Morning Pit Mailbag here on YouTube.com slash Pentelaircom. Yeah, it's Friday. It's the, that means we do the uh, mailbag here on the Morning Pit, YouTube.com slash Pentelaircom. Of course, if you've watched these videos before, you know that we do a mailbag every Friday. If you haven't watched these videos before, you will soon learn that I ask you to do a couple things every day, not just Fridays, but every day of the week. I ask you to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantheler.com, so you don't miss any of our pit video content. If you want to ask questions, you got to be a member of pantheler.com. If you just like watching, well, then do me a favor and just like the video because that would be uh, really cool, and uh, we like seeing those numbers go up. So like this video and subscribe, youtube.com slash pantheler.com like i say we take the questions on our between fifth and forbes message board at pantheler.com so let's jump into it there we had a couple questions to wrap up from last week as Daniels asked uh looking uh looking at it seems like pitt is always targeting some of the same players as a few other schools i feel like they prioritize good students and that might be the link any thought to that some schools lock on any four stars. We don't even try to compete for all four stars yet. We do compete, and only Clemson really has better results, but barely one on one. Um, so, in terms of Pitt's like recruiting, all right, I, I think you have to think about if you want to look at the schools that you're recruiting against, or you typically recruit against, or schools that you beat in recruiting battles. I, I think you have to look at sort of the tiers of college football, right? Uh, you know, if you're talking about if you're going head to head with Ohio State, Michigan, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, and, and you're winning those battles, just just to name a few, that's not the, the the full list. But if you're going against those schools and you're winning those battles, that's that's a huge success. That that's a big win. That's how you're going to build a good recruiting class. If you're Pitt, far more often, where Pitt, I think, where 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 they should be, where they probably want to be. And, and where they mostly have been is sort of the next tier down. And, and it's a tier that Pitt inhabits. It's a tier that's largely, you know, the vast majority of college sports. But you want to be beating Virginia Tech for recruits. You want to beat Michigan State for recruits. Um, you want to be, um, you know, you want to beat Kentucky and West Virginia for recruits. You want to beat North Carolina and NC State for recruits. Uh, you want to beat... You know, Indiana and Purdue, that that level of the Big Ten for recruits. I mean, you'd like to be able to go toe to toe with you know Oregon and UCLA. You don't necessarily overlap with those schools very much, given you know geographic recruiting areas. But you'd like to be able to go toe to toe with those schools and win. I would say those are good wins. It, it, I think if you're Pitt and a lot of schools, your your approach has to sort of be like this: like, okay, who are we playing the most? What level of college football are we playing the most? Who do we want to be better than to get ourselves as close to that top tier as we can be? And 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 that's the level. You want to consistently beat those other teams at your level. You don't want to just be consistently beating group of five teams. You know what I mean? You don't want to just be consistently beating the MAC and and uh, the Sun Belt for recruits. You want to consistently beat mid-tier and low-tier ACC, Big Ten, SEC, Big 12 programs, and, and occasionally Pac-12 or, or whatever they're calling that out there now. That's that's the area where you want to recruit. And I don't, and I think that's where they end up overlapping because, they, you know, Georgia Tech is looking at it like we need to beat Pitt for recruits. You know, Virginia Tech is saying we need to beat, oh, Virginia Tech probably thinks too highly of themselves. Uh, but, you know, I, I think Michigan State you know, Purdue are, are saying we need to beat Pitt for recruits. Those are the kind of recruiting battles we need to win consistently if we want to then beat that level of teams, which is the majority of the teams we face, on the field consistently. 
And so, you know, I, I think you see a lot of overlap because those schools tend to target the same level of, of players. And so that's why you see Pitt going after a lot of the same, you know, a, a lot of Pitt going up against a lot of the same schools. Um, maybe it has to do with the level of students. Not, I, I don't think quite as much, you know, every now and then you might have some battles that sort of end up being battles because of that. But I think for the most part, it's, it's just because you sort of find your level. And you try to win at your level, both on the field and off. Uh, and so that's why I think you see it. Uh, Chad Papp had a question last week, said, given both the message board's poor spelling and the fact that, quote, a six foot seven Bosnian wing that can shoot is tough to hear over and over, I propose going forward, we only refer to Amzil Dalalic as Fez, which is obviously a nod to Wilmer Valderrama's foreign exchange student character on that 70s show. What do you think? I don't like it. I don't think we would ever call him Fez. I'm never going to call him Fez. I actually think Amzil Dalalich is not that hard. I, you know, like I think in the grand, I mean, in the grand pantheon of, of names that are difficult to spell or pronounce, I don't think Amzil Dalalich is very high on the list. I think you can manage. You know, I think most of us can spell Dalalich. I think most of us can manage to uh, spell Amzil, and I think we can all pronounce it now too, unless he tells us that it's it's pronounced differently than Amzil Dalalich. Um, I'm gonna go with that. And, uh, I, I think, I think we can all handle it. So I don't think we need, you know, too much of a shorthand or a nickname for Amzal Dalalich. I, I think his name will do. And I think we'll be, we'll all be able to manage and, and move forward with it. Um, all right, moving into this week's questions. We'll start with Smenges who always has good questions for us says, uh, regarding the number one receiver discussion, wouldn't having three very good but not number one guys be preferable to having a true number one but only average guys at the other wide receiver positions? What is actually gained by having a wide receiver who fits the number one definition other than you have a great player in an important position? Well, like your either or question here, wouldn't it be better to have three very good guys rather than one number one and, and a bunch of just average guys? I mean, First of all, it depends on the level of that number one. If it's Larry Fitzgerald and a bunch of average guys, which, I mean, you know, 2003, I think, you know, Chris Wilson was a nice player. Or, uh, who else did they have on that team? Um, was Prince L. Brockenbro on that team? Best fan shirt ever. Oh, like, I, I still bring this up that uh, I, I still remember walking through Oakland as an undergrad and seeing somebody selling, you know, like knockoff place selling on, on the sidewalk, a, a t-shirt that said, I know it's only Brock and bro, but I like it. And I love that shirt. It's still sticks in my head. I need to look on eBay and see if anyone's got that or selling it. I'm sure there's a pit fan out there somewhere who has an, I know it's only Brock and bro, but I like it t-shirt, but I digress. If you have, you know, I mean, first of all, your either or question, I, I think there's a few issues with it. Cause again, if you have a number one receiver and, you know, a legit number one receiver and a bunch of average guys. Well, you know, it depends on the level of that legit number one. You know, if it's Larry Fitzgerald in 2003, I'd say you can win a lot of games that way and he can be really good. So that would be better. If your number one wide receiver is more along the lines of like Jester Wea in 2016 or, um, you know, uh, what was his name? Bub Means last year. Uh, you know, if, if it's not like sort of a stratospheric number one, then, then yeah, you'd rather have three very good guys, but I don't think this is a question. I don't think this is what Pitt is facing this year. I don't think Pitt is facing an either or of, well, they could have had this, but they ended up with this. I, I think there's just a lot of uncertainty and you just don't know if any of those guys provide that. I mean, what is gained by having a number one wide receiver uh, other than having a great player at an important position? I mean, just the attention that a number one wide receiver is going to command. If you can go out there and go one on one with every receiver Pitt puts on the field, that makes it a lot easier for the defense. If there's a guy that always has to be monitored, always has to be watched, I mean, defenses in 2021 needed to know where Jordan Addison was at all times. It was a non negotiable. You could not let that guy get loose. And as a credit to Mark Whipple as an offensive coordinator, uh, and Jordan Addison is a route runner that he got open as much as he did. And it's still remarkable when you watch some of the highlights from that year, you're like, how did they lose Jordan Addison? Like how, how did they, how did the defense lose track of where that guy was? If anybody on the roster that you, any, any of Pitt's skill guys, you had to keep an eye on. That's the one. If you don't have that guy, it's much easier to defend. 
if you don't have a player who commands that level of attention, it's much easier to uh, to, to stop the other receivers uh, because you can pay more focus to them, pay more attention to them. And it's, it's a lot easier to stop the run because you're not as focused on that one guy. A, a deep threat playmaking wide receiver, uh, a legit number one, whether it's Addison or Fitzgerald or even Tyler Boyd, you know, that that changes the equation. You have to pay attention to that. You know, like you know, even if you want to talk about Jester Wea, Jester Wea commanded attention because of how he could get downfield. And so I think there is a lot of value in having that. And it is an important distinction to make. And and I know, Smedges, you probably feel like I'm, I'm, you know, talking it into the ground by bringing it up as often as I do. And, uh, and, and, you, and you're probably not wrong about that. But I still think it, it's a legitimate concern of, of not knowing who fills that role for Pitt this season, uh, or if anyone will. Uh, Smedge just has another question, says, as a response to the bummer layer theme recently, which ACC football teams would you say will easily be better than Pitt this season? Which teams on Pitt's schedule are obviously better than Pitt? So, you know, I, you raise a point that I, I've tried to make about this schedule. Uh, you know, Jim and I talked about it on Wednesday night during the live stream. When we talked to, you know, I, I, I've brought it up sort of vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Nate Yarnell discussion. When I talk about Nate Yarnell and his stats from the final two games, those two starts that he made, and how, you know, if you project him out over 13 games, those two starts you projected over 13 games, it's like a 3,000-yard season with 20 touchdowns and six interceptions. And the response to that would be, well, yeah, but they were playing Boston College and Duke. And my response to that is, this schedule is full of Boston Colleges and Dukes. I mean, they actually have Boston College, but I mean, you run down the schedule here, Kent State, Cincinnati, West Virginia, Youngstown State. Look, okay, there's your first four games. And I'm not saying they're going to go 4-0 in those four games because we all know Pitt has never gone undefeated in the non-conference when they, you know, in a year when they played more than one non-conference game. And so I'm not going to predict that they go undefeated there, but there's nobody that jumps off the page out of that group of four that you would say, wow, they're so much better than Boston College and Duke were last year. Now, North Carolina, okay, set them aside for a second. Cal and Syracuse, yes, Syracuse has a lot of hype right now, and they got the, the quarterback transfer from Ohio State, but let's let's see. You know, SMU, set them aside. Virginia, same thing. Clemson and Louisville, set them aside, and then Boston College. So I, I'm really setting four games aside here. North Carolina, SMU, Clemson, and Louisville. Um, Louisville and SMU on the road, North Carolina on the road, Clemson at Akershore Stadium. I don't know what Carolina is going to be this year. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how they move forward from the Drake May era. I don't know if they have a great option waiting. I mean, I, you know, I've read about some of the quarterbacks they have, but I need to actually see that they're going to be great before I believe that they're going to be great. But it can be tough to play games in Chapel Hill. That's a tough place to play. Uh, Pitt has never won there. And so that's going to be a real challenge. Um, SMU, I think on the road, SMU looks like they could be a pretty good team. I think that's going to be a tough one. Clemson by reputation, if nothing else, I, I think their defense is still going to be really good. I don't know if their offense will actually take steps forward this season. Uh, and then Louisville. Yeah. I, I just sort of, um, believe in, in, in Jeff Brom. I, I mean, I think he's just really good coach. And they're bringing in a, a power five quarterback transfer to replace Jack Plummer. He obviously did a really good job with Plummer last year. Pitt won that game, um, but I think that's going to be a tough game, particularly on the road. So those are the four games I have circled as the biggest challenges on the schedule. But I think the other eight, they're all winnable games. I, I don't know. There's one team I look out of, out of those eight and I'm like, oh, they are so much better than Pitt. And I, I mean, even when you look at those other four, the Carolina SMU Syracuse and, and Clemson games I, I don't know that I look at them necessarily and say boy they're so much better than Pitt I think they're just sort of factors that go into each one that say that's going to be more challenging than the other eight games so to answer your question like who is demonstrably better than Pitt no more than probably a couple of teams uh the best team you know it's but that, that doesn't guarantee you wins um you need to uh, actually go out and if you if you are better than another team or you have you know comparable talent level you need to go out and win those games um so i mean to answer your question you know how exactly did you phrase it here uh which teams on Pitt's schedule are obviously better than Pitt? i'm not sure if there are a lot there's just a couple um and then we'll see what happens in the games spada 09 says are we running the panther hyphen lair college football 25 online dynasty on playstation or xbox 
Well, I'll tell you what, if PlayStation or Xbox wants to send me a video game system and that game, I'll, yeah, I'll get one set up and, and we'll, uh, we'll get it going. Otherwise our Xbox 360 that doesn't turn on and my kids Nintendo switch, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get it going on either one of those platforms, but it looks like fun though. Uh, Rhombus 58 says, sorry, if already asked, uh, what's your prediction on Pitt's home record this year? Kent state, West Virginia, Youngstown state, Cal, Syracuse, Virginia, Clemson is five and two reasonable four and three would seem disappointing with that list. Um, all right. So let's make our first assumption and put Kent state and Cal or uh, Kent state and Youngstown state in the win column. I know, I, I know, I know, I know. Let's just do it, okay? Just for the sake of argument, let's just put those two in the win column. So to get to five and two, you need three more wins out of the other five games. You need three wins against West Virginia, Cal, Syracuse, Virginia, Clemson. I I, I think that's very doable. I, I I really do. You know, I mean, I think and again, Clemson by reputation, if nothing else, uh, will be a challenge. But I mean, Virginia doesn't look like they got that much better. The jury's still out on Syracuse, Cal. Doesn't seem like they might be very good this year. And I mean, like, West Virginia, for this great season they had last year, will they score against Pitt like 17 points? If Phil Dracovic, Phil Dracovic is not a complete disaster in that game, Pitt very well could win in Morgantown. But he was a disaster, and so they lost. So, yeah, can I find five wins out of that group of seven? Absolutely. Um, and, and, and borderline six, you know, if Pitt gets average quarterback play as we always keep coming back to. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, like, it, am I going to sit here and predict? Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll predict five and two at home. How about that? Uh, the special sauce says, how many more transfers will be added to the football roster and will the basketball team fill its last open scholarship? So uh, special sauce asked this question on Wednesday night. This was after the addition of Anthony Johnson, the defensive tackle commitment uh kid from pittsburgh he went to high school at Jeanette, but he actually grew up in brookline he commuted to Jeanette, which that sounds awful uh that's a terrible commute uh went to bowling green out of high school transferred to youngstown state after one year played four years with the penguins transferred to illinois last december went through spring camp with illinois went into the transfer portal again committed to mississippi state and on the day he was supposed to leave to move to starkville committed to pit uh we think that's his last commitment. He worked out with the team yesterday, so he's he's fully in with Pitt now. I, I don't know if they'll add many transfers beyond that. I, I think that will be it, unless a couple more sort of surprise spots come open. But I think that'll be it for the transfers. Basketball-wise, yeah, I would expect them to fill the last scholarship. Um, you know, probably a, uh, a, a body. You know what I mean? Uh, a last guy, maybe even maybe it just goes to a walk on. I, but I, I imagine they'll try to have thirteen scholarship players. Uh, but I don't think it, a football at anybody else. Let's see. Uh, East Ender Two says, with the pace the offense plans to play at this year, do you think that not only will the offense need to play more players, but the defense also to keep players fresher? Um, so, I mean, I think there's a couple things that'll come out of this, this pace and this tempo, if they're able to pull it off, if they're able to actually play at this tempo, uh, one, I mean, I think obviously Pitt's offense is going to be better. You know, they're going to, they're going to be prepared to play in it and they'll, they'll have their substitutions down. I think their conditioning will be improved. Uh, but yeah, I think Pitt's defense will be better prepared for facing tempo offenses after they go through all of spring camp and training camp, practicing against this tempo offense. Um, I think they'll master or, or, or get a better mastery of how to substitute. I, I think their conditioning will be improved. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of things that will, you know, I, that they'll benefit from facing this. You know, I mean, last year they faced sort of a glacial pace offense uh, in, in practice. And, you know, I don't know if that necessarily impacted the way they played in games, but now they're going to practice against this tempo offense, you know, every day. And then they'll get into the season and most of the teams they face, if not all, are going to feel like they're going slow because they're going to go at a, a lighter pace than what Pitt practices at. So I think it will benefit the defense. I, I think it will um, help them with their conditioning and help them with getting ready to face those kind of uh, offenses once they get into the season. All right. 
Here's the last one. J-Town Panther fan says, uh, looking at the wide receiver room this year, who do you see as being a legitimate deep threat on this year's team? Well, that, I mean, that comes back to some of the conversation we had with Smedges, right? About the number one wide receiver. I don't know who's a deep threat on this team. Kanate Mumfield has caught some passes downfield, but I'm not sure that's his best game. Um, Dejon Reynolds is more of a middle distance guy. We don't know about Kenny Johnson. Uh, sincerely and Raphael Williams seem to have the speed to get downfield, but can they make those contested catches? Can they, can they get downfield and make a play? We don't know. And so, it, you know, maybe my biggest issue with the, with the wide receivers is, is just the uncertainty that I just don't know who's going to step up. I don't know who's going to be good. I don't know who's going to excel. I don't know who's going to be the deep threat. I don't know who's going to be able to stretch the field vertically. I don't know who's going to be the number one wide receiver, which is an important role to have. So I don't know. Like, I'm not sure who has that ability. I'm sure they would all say they, they all do it. They all go downfield and all this kind of thing. But legitimately, who are they going to target downfield? I don't know. Maybe the Western Carolina guys. Maybe Sincere Lee and, and Raphael Williams. Um, just out of, w- with their speed, being able to get downfield. Uh, but I'm not sure I see that skill set. I mean, I guess we'll see what Kenny Johnson can do. It's a lot of uncertainty about that wide receiver group. And that that's what concerns me. That's what concerns me. Maybe you're not concerned about it. Well, I, I think uh, who asked that question? Chad Pap, you are, or no, J-Town Panther fan. Sorry, J-Town Panther fan, you're concerned about it. Smenges might not be, but uh, I am, and so I'm, I'm there with you. All right, great questions today, everybody. I appreciate uh, everybody who chimed in on the message boards with a question for the mailbag. Remember, if you want to get a question in for next week's mailbag, the place to do it is on the Between Fifth and Forbes message board right there at panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com to get all of your uh, Pitt Sports coverage and to participate in the Friday mailbag. Thanks so much for watching today. Thanks, everybody, with the questions. Thanks, everybody, who likes this video. Thanks, everybody, who subscribes to this video. And thanks for watching all week. I hope you've had a great week. I hope you enjoy your Friday and have a great weekend. And we'll catch up with you on Monday for the Morning Pit right here on youtube.com slash panther